So thanks for joining us today. Uh, we're here with an HBA panel on content creation in the cloud. Uh, I'm Jonathan Mills. I'm the Director of Accounts and Partnerships at Metal Toad. Uh, we're a technology consulting firm that specializes in media and entertainment. Um, we'll go ahead and introduce our, our panelists today. Uh, we're starting with uh, Per Lindgren at NetInsight. Thanks, Jonathan. Hi, folks. My name is uh, Per Lindgren. I'm CTO and co-founder of NetInsight. And NetInsight is doing a video media transport, both for the contribution uh, of typically live sports and news into the production environments, and also for doing the primary distribution out to the playouts and out to the rights holders. Fantastic. Thank you, Per. Uh, Josh Gold. Hi, I'm Josh Gold. I'm the executive producer at Riot, Verizon Media's content innovation studio. And we're focusing on mainly 3D formats and the future of content. And Ben. Hi, everybody. I'm Ben Gittenstein. I run product at Cumulo. We make uh, petascale file data lakes that customers can use to build awesome content in AWS and on-premises. So to start off, I want to ask the group uh, how operating in the cloud has changed the content creation or production landscape. And, and feel free to, you know, extend yourselves a little bit uh, because I think this panel is really about looking around the corner uh, as much as it is observing what's happening right now in the marketplace. When it comes to live productions, you know, traditionally people have been, been sitting on-prem at the stadiums, at the arenas to do the production, then sending back the, 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 the services and the feeds. That's not been possible because people haven't been able to sit you know, at the, the on-prem studios or, or the Uber events. So they've been forced to really uh, do the productions more remotely and doing distributed and remote productions. Uh, and also making use of people literally have been sitting at home. So the use of internet, IP, and in that respect, also the cloud-based workflows and the flexibility it gives has been key in this change. And, and this, this trend is, is really here to stay. Do you see, Josh, enterprise-level content creation changing slowly in this direction as well? I mean, are you seeing adoptions? You know, Riot is, is a piece of the larger Verizon media puzzle, but are you seeing sort of the major networks and studios embracing this as a pilot or MVP uh, approach at this point to try to test the waters? Yeah, completely. And I think one of the best examples right now is probably The Mandalorian, but that was a full virtual production series. And the success of that show and the fidelity of that show and the fact that they were able to do it on a super innovative leading edge stage for a fraction of the cost of what it would have done or would have run them even a year ago, two years ago, I think is, is proof that everybody is moving in those workflows and those new pipelines. And I, I think that as the, as, as the world changes in the previous trend, as we all embrace remote work and we realize that remote work, per Josh's point about the Mandalorian, remote work can really work. Uh, I, I think a lot of what wasn't bolted down will move to the cloud. But the, one of the things we experience, at least, is that in that process, the heaviest thing is often the data. Getting the data into the public cloud and then having it reside there in a low latency, high performance, um, secure, all those things kind of way really ends up being an important part of this picture. And again, it's just because the speed of light didn't change. So let me back up, sorry, because I have a tendency to, to go off. Modularity versus monolithic solutions. Each of you represent a piece of a modular workflow in the cloud. I think it would be helpful for our audience and for me to understand what that piece is specifically for, for, you know, and this is not from a marketing perspective, but literally from a workflow perspective. Uh, and then perhaps how you landed on that. Because Per, you know, you're unique in, at NetInsight. You must have seen a market, a piece of the market uh, uh, that needed to be addressed. And, and, uh, and, and here you are, right? So I would be interested to kind of understand where you personally or where your companies recognize this transition to modularity in, in the cloud from a media uh, content perspective? 
actually modularity we we are modularizing and virtualizing both both our cloud based uh, solutions but also actually all old appliance uh, solutions as well uh, to really make it modular uh, what we see when moving into the cloud um, is is really driven from the flexibility and the scalability for for our customers doing the more more live productions and, and also another just benefit of, of bringing everything into the cloud is that you have all of a sudden all the content there. And really people are looking now at the next generation, what they call like sports fan experience, uh, which is more personalized, more social. People are interacting more with each other and with the content. And traditionally you just had one feed coming out. So I, I usually say loud productions is, is a huge content of waste. You have 40 cameras in a big, big uh, sports stadiums, but you just said one feed to the consumers. Bringing all the feeds into the cloud means you can personalize the content. People can start choosing what type of feed they can have. You can have different angles. Uh, you can have a player cam or, or referee cams. Uh, and these things are, are all of a sudden possible. And you can also do your social uh, media uh, production at the same time as you're doing your, your main feeds. So it, it just opens up for a new experience for, for the consumers and, and for the fans. Um, you, I want to stop you and ask specifically, are you imagining a landscape in which, you know, if you're a soccer fan, you can let's say, I'm a, you know, I'm a Chelsea fan, that I can go and watch the Chelsea games, and I'm just going to focus on, you know, Christian Pulisic because I'm interested in what he's doing. And there will be a, potentially a dedicated feed with just his performance in the game, and that I can watch that as a a single stream. You know, absolutely. So I think that together with much more graphics involved in that that possibility, you can also get the statistics of him while watching him. Uh, the same goes for, for golf or, or, like I said, a, a MotoGP. You want to follow your driver or your player and you want to select that. You don't want to watch that, uh, you know, um, the one that the producer wants you to watch. You, you want a more personalized experience. And again, bringing everything into the cloud just gives all those possibilities. That, that modification of consumer behavior is really interesting too, because if you can get to that point where I turn on the game and I then literally have a choice of how I want to watch it. Yeah. Uh, that's, consumer, that's powerful. Because you nearly becomes the producer in, the, in that respect, right? Intriguing. Josh, I'm sure you, you have something to say about this. I mean, just getting into specifics of that example from Pear, I mean, we're, we're more or less there. And we've been working a lot specifically with the NFL just based on the, the Verizon partnership there. And, it's been fun to figure out what the future of those fan experiences look like. And while watching NFL is one of the most robust statistics APIs in the business. And when you could pull that real time API into a 3d experience and allow the fan, like you said, to click on their favorite player and literally watch real time stats start to unravel in front of you. And then you toggle over and click on another button and you get a photo reel avatar of that player that we've captured in the off season volumetrically standing next to you in your living room and layer <laughs> and layer some AI on top of that. So you could actually have a bit of a conversation with your favorite player. All of a sudden your mind is blown and the fan experience is just completely unique and different. So you layer all of these kind of modular functions and experiences on top of each other that the cloud is really going to unlock and it, ch it changes the game for consumers and all of the industries. Sports, I think, is kind of, and fandom, I think, is a fun one to discuss because that's happening now. But it, it really is going to change things very quickly and, and unlock really cool future instances for us. Yeah, I was going to say, it doesn't just have to be sports, right? I mean, yeah, anything. Any, I mean, any of the Marvel or DC or Mandel, I mean, you could become part of the Star Wars universe, right? I mean, yeah. so and, and education as well. I mean, we're doing a lot with uh, Verizon Innovative Learning Division and, and they fund experiences to try to figure out how to revolutionize education and whether that's in classroom education or currently whether that's at home education and working with different think tanks around the world to figure out what students retain more and why 
when they're experiencing something in kind of a 3D level or, or customized person to person, or whether they just read it in a textbook. You know, it's, it's all data-based. So we're really trying to figure out how to make things work in a better way. I know I have a lot of friends with children who would be really happy with an AR teacher uh, <laughs> in their house. <laughs> or hear the history of Christopher Columbus from Christopher Columbus rather than just reading a paragraph in the outdated textbook. So there's ways to bring these things to life, which I think allow specifically in education children to experience things differently and then retain more, hopefully. That's super intriguing. Ben? Well, I'm, I'm listening to all of this and I'm thinking, thinking about this both as a head of product for a company that helps organizations like the other folks on here work with data, but then also just as a consumer and a parent, um, there's a, a couple of thoughts come to mind. The first is it, it feels like what's happening is technology is enabling us to each individual or family can now all of a sudden have a unique experience of the same thing. So we can all go to the same, uh, I'm a big hockey fan. So like we can all go watch the same hockey game, but we can be following different players and have, it's the same game, but we're having each having a unique experience of it as opposed to a single monolithic experience. And that's like a, that's a really interesting new, new world to create for people. We can all go to the same classroom, but each of us have a, and be working on the same project, but each of us have a different experience of the education that that's a, I mean, just as a kid of the 80s and 90s, like that's real different than when I used to go to movies. And oh, that sends chills up my arms, to be honest. Yeah. Like it's really a powerful vision that couldn't exist without the cloud workload at all. Yeah. Uh, and, and I'll just jump like, the as a head of product for a company. To me, the thing that gets me excited just about my tiny little role to play in that ecosystem is the data that fuels all of those experiences. The images, the videos, the the raw raw image, and the finished product that like all of that is what gets us. I get very excited about that because all of those things, whether you're talking about analyzing, you know, distance from catch, or um, or speed of slap shot, or just taking you know an experience of the Mandalorian and turning it on its head for each different viewer, all of those are fueled by data pre and post production data. And I mean, from for us, like what we get excited about every day is, okay, how do we make it easier for content creators to put all that data in one place and then seamlessly work from it either on prem or in the cloud, mostly in the cloud, to be honest. And that gets that gets very, very exciting. And I, I don't know, I just think it's cool that we're helping you guys that we play some tiny role in helping you guys build those experiences, because then I want to go experience them. Um, I'm getting a bit granular or tactical, you know, we talked briefly about security concerns. Uh, the cloud is, is, you know, the public cloud, right? You know, to, to frame it, the public cloud is secured by the cloud providers, but in each of your roles, you are individually responsible for securing uh, the data associated with your clients and or your businesses. Um, okay. And that is a concern, and it's increasingly becoming a uh, very real concern with the number of hacks that we see every day and the number of, of penetration uh, that we see into these public clouds. Uh, how are you guys mitigating that, you know, at least from what you can talk about publicly? Um, and what are your concerns, you know, or should there, should, you know, what are the, are we moving faster than the security apparatus? <laughs> Uh, is is uh, allowing us, uh, or do you feel like there's a, a reasonable set of checks and balances happening in that space? Pair? I, I think as soon as you move to open IP uh, internet and, and the cloud, of course, uh, the security comes of, of, of concern. I mean, we, we're talking about Know, really high high end content like, like Mandalorian, but also like sports. And you know, two three years ago in the cloud, we we mainly did tier two, tier three types of sports. But now also the tier two, tier one sports is moving to the cloud. And of course, the that's the price of that content is staggering. And and so both, I 
we say both security and the reliability and how you build your your processes and, and your workflows to to handle redundancy and security is is a big concern uh, and you need to do it right and 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 therefore we are in the early days, I think, still. I mean, we're doing so much things and there are so many features and, and applications possible now that you also need to tie it together into an end-to-end -end workflow. And the, that whole workflow has to be secure and redundant reliable. And so I, I think that that's the, I think the individual parts people have thought about and, and make sure, but you have to think about the, end-to-end -end workflow, end-to-end -end solutions to make sure it's it's um, both reliable and, and secure and redundant all, all the way. I mean, I think for us, just being part of a telco, everything is, is security and protocol first, and then everything comes after that. And it's about the entire pipeline. You know, sometimes we're working on closed IP, sometimes open internet, but it's always about securing from end-to-end -end and more often than not, now more than ever, is is multiple redundancies throughout. So specifically for live, but but even in any type of virtual capture, we were building in more redundancies and and various fallbacks that we never had to before. So it's it's always top of mind now. I'd also say there's been an interesting change in the industry where we used to think of security and availability as different concerns. We used to think of is my data safe as different from is my workload up and can I be sure that the workload will never go down? And I think actually those two concerns have sort of merged and now they're kind of the same thing, which is like, if the workload goes down, that's a security threat and a security threat can bring the workload down. And both of those end up being sort of the same net result. So like one of the things we found is our customers insisting on highly redundant ways of operating, not just because to Josh's point or, or to pairs like a, a building security in depth, but also because they want to make sure that the workload never stops because the fact is the factory never stops, right? It's always running. So those two things of security and availability have sort of, they've come together in an interesting way. Thanks to you all. That was a really interesting conversation.